All right, amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you very much. This morning, I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 4, verse 31 through 37. And as you're turning there, I want to mention um, this afternoon at 2.30, we'll have the groundbreaking ceremony for the Alpha Pregnancy Center. So if you would like to come out for that, that'll again be at 2.30. And that's at the building next to Chris Thomas's um, trucking company. Luke chapter 4. Verses 31 through 37. Starting in verse 31, the Bible says, And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, How, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out, and reports about him went into, out into every place in the surrounding region. You know, when you come to church, there's several things that you expect to find at church. I mean, when you came this morning, certainly you expected to find fellow worshipers, uh, people who are coming to worship the Lord and hear from Him. Uh, hopefully, you came this morning bringing your Bible. So you come to church, you find, you find Bibles, you find hymnals, um, you find all sorts of things. But one thing that you probably didn't come expecting to find, and that's the devil, but in our text today, we learn about the day the devil showed up at church. You know, the Gospels were written in order to teach us exactly who Jesus Christ was. Not only we learn about the identity of Christ and who he was, but we also learn why he came. So we have already seen as we have uh, studied in the book of Luke, these first four chapters, uh, we have already learned some things about Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he said, My desire is to know Christ. That was Paul's ultimate desire, was to grow in his knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ. And hopefully, uh, as believers, that is all of our desire, is that we want to grow in our knowledge of Christ. And as we study the Gospel of Luke, uh, we learn a lot about Christ. We learn about who he is. In these first four chapters, much emphasis has been placed on, on the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, his identity. At his baptism, several weeks ago, we saw the Father, God the Father, proclaiming that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And, uh, and, 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 and throughout the gospel, we see that that identity, that he was the Son of God, was proven. But as we move through this gospel, now we come to a section to where we learn not only about the person of Christ, but we learn about his power and his authority. And we're going to see that in, in several different ways. First of all, we're going to see his power and his authority as seen in his teaching. Uh, we saw that some last week as he went to Nazareth and he was teaching. The people were amazed at his ability to teach uh, the word. And we're going to see that again today, that the people were amazed at his authority as he taught the word. But also we're going to see his power and his authority over Satan uh, demons, and also illness. So you can say this, that Jesus Christ had power and authority over everything and over everyone because of who he was, God's own son. Now to, today we learn about his power and authority over uh, the enemy, the demons of hell. 
this, this week perhaps you heard about the lady who down in Daytona Beach drove her, her minivan that had her three children in the back seat. She drove it right into the ocean. And her goal was is that she wanted to take her children to a better place. And they interviewed her sister, and her sister said that she was concerned about her, her sister because her sister was talking about demons. Now, we don't know uh, for sure if, if the devil and his demons uh, were actually causing her to do this. Um, certainly, there could have been mental illness, but it's just a reminder that we are in a spiritual war. And that is not only true for believers, but it is true for unbelievers as well. There is, a, there is a battle going on right now in the spiritual realm. And sometimes we forget that because we can't see it uh, with our eyes. But we know by faith that there is this battle uh, going on. Satan and his demons are at war with God. Uh, now we know that ultimately for us as believers, the battle over Satan was won at the cross and through the resurrection. But the enemy knows that he has a limited amount of time, and so he seeks to do everything he can to thwart the plan of God. Now, there's, there's two common errors that are made in regards to the enemy. The first one is this. The first error is a lack of acknowledgement of the existence of the devil and demons. It's amazing to me the number of people who say, yeah, I believe in God and I believe in angels, but I don't believe that there is such thing as a literal devil. You know, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah and even in Revelation that the, that the devil, Lucifer, was one of the most beautiful angels in heaven and he was filled with pride and he wanted to take the throne of God. And so there was this rebellion in heaven, and, and, and Lucifer and a third of the angels were cast out of heaven. So we read the Bible, and we know that, that the devil is, is real. He's not symbolic of some of, of things. Some people say, well, the devil is, is our addictions, and that's, that's the devil. But the Bible teaches that the devil is, is a real person and that there are such things as, as demons. And so often there is this um, overemphasis on mental illness and we say, well, that, that, there's no such thing as the devil or demons. That's just a mental illness. Now, perhaps sometimes it is. But so the first uh, common error is a lack of acknowledgement or refusal to believe in the existence of the enemy. But a second error... Is, is, is this, there is an overemphasis on the devil and demons. And so this error says that there is a demon behind every bush. The devil made me do it. Have you ever heard that said? Maybe you've even said that yourself. The, the devil made me do it. There's a demon for every single sin. There's a demon of pornography. There's a demon of alcoholism. And we are to go around and we're to find the, the, the demons and we're to bind demons and we're to cast them out. Did you know that nowhere in the New Testament are believers in Jesus Christ ever commanded to bind and cast out demons? Now we are told to resist the devil, but we're never commanded to go around trying to bind and cast demons out. And so ultimately the devil tempts us to, to fall in one of two camps. If we live in ignorance of the existence of the devil, well then he, he has us. Because if you don't realize who your enemy is, and you don't realize you're in a battle, well then you're always going to lose the battle. But if there's an overemphasis on him, the focus is taken off of Christ, and it is placed on the devil. So today we turn to the scriptures and we look at this text here in Luke and we learn some things about the enemy and how he works. But most importantly, we learn today that Jesus Christ has authority and power over the devil. We don't have to fear the devil. We don't have to live in fear of the devil because Christ uh, was victorious. He is victorious over the devil. Now let's notice verse 31. It says, And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. Now last week, we find that Jesus was in Nazareth. 
And uh, what's interesting is, is Capernaum is actually north of Nazareth, but the text says that he went down to Capernaum. That is because Nazareth was about 1,200 feet above sea level, whereas Capernaum was a fishing village, and it was about 686 feet below Capernaum. So, so you could say that you had, to, you had to go down from Nazareth to get up to Capernaum. So Jesus leaves Nazareth and he goes to Capernaum. Now Capernaum was a fishing town. It was the hometown of Peter, who Peter certainly was a fisherman. And Capernaum served as Jesus' home base for about a year and a half for his ministry in Galilee. And it is here that we find Jesus performing his very first miracle as taught in the book of Luke. This is the very first miracle that Luke records in his gospel. And this miracle is, is that Jesus cast this demon out of a man in order to show that not only did he have authority to teach the Word of God, but he had the authority to enforce the Word of God. So as we look at this encounter that Jesus had with this demonic spirit, I want to point out five things that are true in regards to the enemy. Number one, and again, this is important because the enemy... Uh, one of his tactics, as I said a moment ago, is for us to live in ignorance. He doesn't want us to know truth. And so let's look at these five truths regarding the enemy. First of all, in verse 33, we see the first truth regarding the enemy is this. The enemy preys on people. The enemy preys on people. The text says that Jesus, he's in Capernaum, is his normal custom. He goes to the synagogue and he is teaching the scriptures, he's teaching the Bible, and there comes one, a man who was filled with an unclean spirit. In the original text, what it is saying is, is that this man was fully possessed by the devil. This man was demon possessed. Now why is it the enemy preys on people? Well, the Bible tells us that all of us, both lost and saved people, are made in the image of God. And so the devil wants to do everything he can to destroy the image of God in you because he hates God. He despises God. He despises everything about God. So therefore he attacks people. He preys on people because he wants to destroy the image of God in us. The Bible says that he is out to seek, steal, and to destroy. And so here he is. He is preying on this man. This man is demon-possessed. Now, let me say two things in regards to demon possession. Number one, saved people cannot be demon-possessed. The Bible says that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. God's house is not going to be divided. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, this is real estate in us that is not available to, to Satan. So saved people cannot be demon-possessed. But a second truth is, lost people, not all lost people, are demon-possessed. Saved people can be demon-oppressed, and all lost people are not demon-possessed. But we do know that lost people are held in bondage. They're held in bondage to the demonic system of the world. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, he said, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. So lost people, before they come to Christ, and this includes you and I, before we came to Christ, our father was the devil. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, he said, You once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that, now work, that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So how does he prey on people? Again, this includes lost people and saved people. How does the devil work? How does he do this? Well, number one, he blinds people. The devil and the demons who work underneath the authority of the devil... They blind people. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he said, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the, of the glory of Christ, who is the image 
of God. So we know that the devil and the demons of hell, they blind unbelievers to the reality of their sins. Now I can only speak for myself, but before I was saved, I didn't really see myself as a sinner. I saw myself as a pretty good person. That's because the devil blinds unbelievers to the reality of their sins. He blinds unbelievers to the penalty for their sins. In other words, lost people, not only are they blind to the reality that they are sinners, but they are blind to the reality that one day they will stand before the creator of the universe and give an account. And outside of Jesus Christ, if lost people die without a relationship with Jesus Christ, they will face an eternity separated from God forever. But the devil works to blind unbelievers' eyes to that reality, to blind their understanding to sin and the seriousness of sins. And also, he blinds unbelievers to the solution for their sins. That's why so often when you talk to somebody who is not saved, they will say, well, I'm okay. Surely when I die, that my good works will be good enough. I'm a faithful church member. I try to read my Bible. I pay my bills on time. I'm a pretty good person. Surely that's going to be enough. That's evidence that the enemy has blinded them to the understanding that their only solution, their only hope is in Jesus Christ. And so he blinds the minds of unbelievers, but also while us as believers, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, while positionally you are clean, your sins have been forgiven, what the enemy will do even to us as believers is he will seek to blind us to the reality of sin in our daily lives. So he wants to blind believers and get them into bondage to sin. So he blinds people. Number two, he deceives people. Ultimately, what the devil does is he deceives people in this aspect. He gets us to question God's word. If you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, that was the very first thing that the devil did with Adam and Eve. He caused them to question what God said in his word. It's about deception. And so it goes like this. Well, God understands your sin. He, this, you have a special case. Your, your case is different. Or I'm okay, I'm not that bad. I'm okay, I can get away with this sin. It's okay, it's okay for me to do this. I know what God's word says, but I'm going to go ahead and do this anyways, and God still will bless my disobedience. So he deceives people. He lies to people. Number three, Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, that the devil is the father of all lies. And so what the devil does is he whispers into people's minds and he says, there is no hope for you. You are such a bad sinner that God, there's no way that God could ever love you. There is no way that God will ever forgive you. There is no hope for you. God will not forgive you of your sin. There is no way out because he wants you to live in bondage to your sin. Or he comes to save people. And he whispers in their ear and he says, How can you commit this sin? There's no way that you could be a believer. There's no way that you could be saved and do this. No wonder Paul said in the book of Romans that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. So he blinds people, he deceives people, and he lies to people. So the enemy preys on people. Also in verse 33, we see a second truth about the enemy. And that is this, the, em the enemy trembles at the truth. He trembles at the truth. So number one, he preys on people. Number two, the enemy trembles at truth. Here's Jesus. Here's he's teaching in the synagogue. And by the way, you'll notice that as he taught there in verse 32, the people were just completely amazed because he taught as one with authority. In those days, a rabbi, whenever he would teach, he would quote other rabbis. And if he was teaching a particular text, he would say, well, such and such rabbi says that this means this, and this rabbi says that this means this. When Jesus taught, he never quoted another rabbi. He simply said, this is what God's word says, this is what it means. So Jesus taught with conviction. Jesus taught with command. 
And they're amazed by it. And here he is, he's teaching. He's teaching the truth. He taught with authority. It was clear and it was convicting. But notice what happens in the midst of Jesus' teaching. There is this demon-possessed man and he screams out. Now, in my time of ministry, I've had some interruptions while I was preaching. I've had babies uh, start crying. I've had people get up and walk out. I've had people, you know, flipping through their Bibles. At my first church, um, every time, every time, and Michelle can vouch for this, every time I would go to preach the Bible, there was one individual in the church, and that would be the moment he would get out his peppermint, and he would unravel his peppermint. And it it was one of those peppermints that had that plastic that was really loud. And on average, it took him about five minutes to unravel the peppermint. Now, I, I don't know if he was aware of, of what was happening, but it was, nonetheless, it was a distraction. But I can tell you, while I've had some interruptions, I have never had an interruption like this. I mean, can you imagine... Here you are at church, you're hearing the Word of God preached to you, and all of a sudden one stands up who's filled with a demon and he cries out. Now, that would be some kind of interruption. And I wonder how long had this demon-possessed man been coming to this synagogue? He'd been coming to this synagogue completely undetected. And I suppose... It's because of this. The enemy, he stays hidden in places where the truth is not taught or where it is taught incorrectly. And whenever God's word is taught correctly, you can be sure of this, the devil will always let you know. And that's what happened here on this day. Jesus is teaching the truth. He's not quoting other uh, uh, teachers. He's not giving this person's opinion on the text. He's teaching exactly the Word of God because, by the way, he wrote it. You can preach with authority when you wrote it. He's preaching with conviction. He's preaching with, with uh, clarity. And the devil couldn't stand it. This demon-possessed individual could, could be silent no more and he cries out. And so how do we apply this? Well, the greatest way to confront and expose the enemy is with God's Word. The devil cannot stand truth because it is the truth that sets the captive free. No wonder Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he admonished uh, Timothy above everything else. The most important thing about Timothy's duty as a minister was to preach the Word. Because... The, the Word is what sets people free. It is, the, it is the truth of God's Word that will release people from their bondage. And the devil knows that. And when the gospel is preached, the enemy trembles because that is when he loses ground. He loses his clutch on people because when people hear the gospel and by faith they respond to the gospel they are freed from the power of the devil and they're transported out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and so the devil begins to lose his influence so we must preach the word we must know the word church it is so important for all of us as believers to daily get into God's word so that we know the truth of God's word those who are trained to look for counterfeit money, they don't study the counterfeit. They study the real thing so that when the counterfeit comes across their path, it immediately sticks out. And so that is why all of us, as God's people, it is our command to study the Word of God so that we're protected from the enemy and his lies. So that as a believer, when 
when you, when you fall into sin and the devil comes along and he whispers in your ear and he tells you that God no longer loves you and that you no longer belong to him, in that moment you can go to Romans chapter 8 and say there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I am secure. Get behind me, Satan. So we must know it. And by God's grace, we must obey it. We must obey the Word of God. So, number two, the enemy trembles at truth. Number three, comes in verse 34, the enemy believes the Bible. The enemy believes the Bible. Notice what verse 34 says. Damon speaks out. He says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now that is so ironic to me. Because we just saw last week as Jesus was speaking in his own hometown, they refused to believe, they refused to acknowledge who Jesus Christ really was. And what do they do? They try to run him out of town. Well, they did run out of town. They wanted to murder him. And so most of the people in the, that, that, that heard the teaching of Jesus, most of the people of Jesus' day never recognized who Jesus truly was. But here is the devil, and the devil, the demons of hell, they know exactly who Jesus is. So that is why I say the enemy believes the Bible. In James chapter 2, verse 19, James says, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons, demons believe and shudder, so they believe the truth. It's not a saving faith, but they believe everything about this word. The devil and his demons, they know this so well they could quote it. And that is why, by the way, so many of the false teachings of today incorporate the word of God, but it's twisted, see? Because the devil knows the word, and he knows how to twist the word. So the enemy believes the Bible. Number four, also comes in verse 34. Not only does the enemy believe the Bible, but the enemy fears the future. He fears the future. Notice what this demon spirit says to Jesus. He says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Because the devil and the demons of hell, because they believe the Bible, they live in constant fear of the future. Because they know what God's word says in regards to their future. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. There was that prophecy given in regards to the devil. And the Lord says, he shall bruise your head. And that is speaking simply of the fact that, that one day, the devil and the, host of of, and the host of demons and their kingdom will be crushed under the rule and authority of Jesus. And of course, if you study in the book of Revelation, we know that, that, that the devil and all the host of demons one day will be cast into the lake of fire where they will be tormented day and night forever. And so this demon here, he thinks that Jesus, Jesus is now on the scene. And he knows what the Bible says regarding his future. And so he's worried here. He thinks that Jesus now is going to go ahead and cast him into the pit. He says, is it, is it my time? Have you come to destroy me? Is my time up? So they fear the future because the future involves torment in the lake of fire. Number five. Number five and finally, in verses 35 through 36, we learn the final truth out of this text regarding the enemy, and that is this. The enemy submits to the Savior. He submits to the Savior. I love this. Notice verse 35. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, what is this word for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So we see here that the enemy, he has to submit to the Savior. Now this is not a healthy submission. They don't do this with joy. 
but they have no other choice because ultimately the enemy is under the rule of God. So notice Jesus' command there. He says, be silent and come out. In those days, there would have, there would have been those self-proclaimed exorcists and they, they had all kinds of formulas and all this hocus-pocus sort of things that they would say to try to cast demons out. Jesus just simply gives a word. Be quiet and come out. And notice the demon's response. After rebelling, he leaves. He leaves, and I love what the text says there in verse 35. It says that he left him, and there was no harm done. No harm done. So the good news today is, Jesus still has the authority and power to speak deliverance into your life, into my life. Jesus can truly set us free. So how do we apply this, this text today? How do we apply this? In Luke chapter 12, verse 5, the Bible says, But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him whom after he is killed has authority to cast in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So if there's anything that we can take away from today's text, it is this simple phrase. Don't fear the devil, fear the Lord. You know, there's so much emphasis in this world today about the devil and how the devil is out to scare people. We need to be afraid of the devil. But the truth is, church, we don't need to fear the devil. We need to fear the one who created the devil. We must fear the the Lord. And what is fearing the Lord? What does that mean? Does that mean that we constantly walk around petrified of the Lord, afraid that He's going to take out a big mallet and just take us out at any moment? No, it just has the idea of reverence. And so there's two ways that we do this. First of all, this is for unbelievers. If you are lost today, if you've never had that time in your life where you have repented of your sins and run to Jesus for salvation, the first way is for you, and that is this. Fear the Lord by trusting Him. Fear the Lord by trusting Him. His Word tells us that the only way to be delivered from your sin and ultimately from Satan is to trust Jesus Christ. If today you are lost, you have never been saved, your only hope is in Jesus Christ. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13-14, through 14, he says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So when we come to that place as unbelievers, and we run to Jesus and we say, Lord, I acknowledge my sin. I confess that I have messed up. I have failed to keep Your Word. And I am not deserving of Your love and Your forgiveness, but I come to You pleading for Your mercy and Your grace. I believe that You gave Your life for me on the cross, and on the third day You rose again, and through Your resurrection You have been victorious over sin and, de over sin and Satan. And I want to take part in that victory, and I give You my life. And when we do that, when we trust Him and we surrender to Him, through our union with Him, we share in His victory. So today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you are in bondage to your sin and you are in bondage to, the, uh, to Satan and, and the rulers of the darkness. And the only way that you can escape is by running to Jesus Christ. And number two, this is for us as believers. We must fear the Lord by obeying His word. Remember I told you when Jesus taught the Word, He taught with authority. There was authority in His Word. Well, it hasn't changed today. When God gave us His Word, He did not give us a book of suggestions. This is His Word. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we don't keep His commandments. We don't obey His Word in order to try to earn or keep our salvation. But by God's grace and through His strength, 
we strive to live obediently to His Word in order that we can glorify His name because of all that He has done for us. And the enemy tries to deceive us and he tries to trick us so that we will live in disobedience to God's Word because he knows that when we live in sin, we forfeit the blessings of living in obedience to to God, And he wants us, even as God's people, to live in bondage to our sins. Because ultimately, when as God's people we fail to live in obedience to God's word, we fail to bring glory to the name of Jesus. So fear the Lord by trusting him, by giving him your life, by surrendering to him. And then number two, fear the Lord by obeying his word. And through that, you tell the Lord, Lord, thank you that you love me. And I love you. And the, one of the ways that I'm going to show my love to you is through obeying your word. And when we do that, when God's people adhere to God's word and we live obediently to his word, the devil trembles. He trembles. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we don't, we don't as your people, like to talk about the enemy. Lord, we thank you that you've given us information in your word that teaches us about him and how he works. Lord, we thank you that through Jesus Christ and your grace, if we today stand as saved people, we know that, that we are saved not by any merit of our own, but simply because of your grace in our life. Lord, for all of us who are saved, we thank you this morning that there was a time in our life that you opened our eyes and you gave us spiritual sight and you showed us our need for forgiveness and you showed us that our solution was in Jesus Christ. And oh Lord, I pray that if anybody today, whether it's here at this physical place or somebody who is listening on the radio, if they are in bondage to sin and they have yet to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today they would run to Jesus. And for any of us who are saved, if, if we're living in sin as a believer, Lord, reveal that to us so that we can repent of it, so that we can confess it and live underneath your hand of blessing. Lord, may we be obedient during this time of invitation. May you receive all the glory and praise. Speak to hearts this morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.